Hey everyone, John Lorden here. Welcome to another episode of Brain Scratch. Happy Friday. For this one, I wanted to dive into a question that I was left with after watching Evil Genius on Netflix. I did a review of Evil Genius on Itchy Mysteries yesterday. You can check that out if you want. Um, I'm going to try to avoid spoilers in this for people that have not seen Evil Genius. I'm really focusing on the question of Brian Wells and was he really involved in the planning of this bank heist or not. So if you haven't seen Evil Genius, I think you're going to be okay to get through this episode. Maybe it will entice you to check it out by the end. It's a really interesting story. It is a little dark and tragic in some places. We're going to drive into the details, see if we can learn a little bit more about Brian Brian and his potential for really being involved in something like this. So with all that being said, let's jump into is Brian Wells a part of this or not? Uh, over at Crimeola, we get started. Brian Wells was either an innocent rube or the co-conspirator in one of the most complex and disturbing bank robberies in American history. Part scavenger hunt, part bank robbery, the heist ended for Wells when a homemade explosive collar locked around his neck detonated. The incident is known as the pizza bomb heist or collar bomb case. It is also the case behind Netflix's four-part documentary series, Evil Genius, the true story of America's most diabolical bank heist. Uh, what can we learn about Brian Wells? Interestingly, the article about him at Wikipedia calls it murder of Brian Wells. And that kind of raises one point I initially wanted to address with you guys. Um, even if he was in the planning phase of all this uh, and he believed that the bomb was going to be fake and then it turned out that the bomb was actually real, uh, someone still had another plan going on within this bank robbery plan to kill him. Uh, was anyone charged for that crime specifically? No spoilers here. You're going to have to check out Evil Genius if you want to learn more about that. Um, but it is interesting because I think there is this perspective of, well, if he was part of it and it was just something that went wrong and, you know, he got stopped by the cops and that's what wound up uh, ki ultimately killing him because he couldn't complete this series of events to get the bomb, dis the bomb disarmed. Uh, is that necessarily a planned murder or not? Um, I think because of the way the game was set up, it was always going to be uh, the murder of Brian Wells, unfortunately. But let's learn more about it here. In a July 2007 indictment, federal prosecutors alleged that Wells had been involved in the planning of the botched bank robbery. On the afternoon of August 28, 2003, Wells received a call to deliver two pizzas to 8631 Peach Street, an address a few miles from the pizzeria. The address was later found to be that of television station WSEE-TV's transmission tower at the end of a dirt road. Uh, another thing that just kind of tickles in my brain about this is the fact that uh, two pizzas were ordered. And admittedly, it's a, tr it's a little bit of a trivial fact because anyone could order two pizzas if you were just trying to get the delivery driver to a particular location. Uh, but in this case, I think it's a little bit telling because of the amount of people that uh, were likely involved in planning all this. The two pizzas actually seem like they were part of a real order <laughs> where people really wanted pizza. According to law enforcement reports, Wells was allegedly meeting people who he thought were his accomplices. He allegedly participated in the planning for the robbery, which included him wearing a fake bomb. If questioned, he was to claim that three black men had forced the live bomb on him and were holding him as a hostage. At the television tower, Wells found the plot had presumably changed as he learned that the bomb was real. He wrestled with the men and tried to flee, but one of them fired a gun, causing Wells to stop. At this time, the collar bomb is assumed to have been latched around his neck. The culprits gave him a sophisticated homemade shotgun, which had the appearance of an unusually shaped cane and two pages of handwritten instructions. Uh, just so you can see, this is the collar bomb, at least remaining pieces of a collar bomb. Um, and this is the shotgun, which I have to say is a terrible, uh, it's a terrible job at trying to mask that this cane is actually a gun. Uh, the trigger is so blatantly obvious. Uh, I just, I don't know. If I would have looked at this thing, I would say something is up with that. That is not a regular cane. And I would be very concerned if I saw someone walk into a bank with something like this. 
Uh, and it's weird because I know that there are guns that are built into canes. I think those have been manufactured for hundreds of years. But um, the instructions, the two hand, the two pages of handwritten instructions uh, were addressed to bomb hostage. Uh, they listed a series of strictly timed tasks to collect keys, which would delay the detonation and eventually defuse it. Additionally, it warned that Wells would be under constant surveillance and any attempts to contact authorities would result in the bomb's detonation. And once they actually started to analyze the bomb, it looked like potentially there was a cell phone that was included in the mechanics of it. However, it turned out to be a fake. I guess the cell phone either was not working or was literally a toy. Uh, although the note claimed that he would gain extra time by each key found, regardless of what had unfolded, Wells would never have had enough time to complete the tasks to get the bomb defused. So uh, once again, it, it's really pointing to me, at least the way that this Wikipedia article is written, which we've had that conversation many times in the past on this channel, um, the assessment that this is a murder plan within a bank heist plan, I think is a good and fair assessment. Uh, I don't believe that he was ever intended to uh, live to the next day, which is really, really terrible. Um, over at theguardian.com, from an article back in 2007, July 22nd, we actually have someone that was an eyewitness to him coming into the bank, and we can uh, learn about the account here. Uh, I believe the man's name is John Siegel. I'm waiting in line, and this man walks into the bank with a cane in his hand. He had this thing under his sweatshirt that looked like a shoebox. He walks over to the teller and gives her a white envelope. He, he talked very low, and I couldn't hear what he was saying. She looked sort of startled. She then stepped away from where she was standing and yelled out, Audrey. It was the bank's code word for robbery. Another teller whispered to a customer to get out. A small group started to leave the bank. We walked right past him, Siegel says. He didn't bat an eye. Um... What's curious about this is if you actually look into the details uh, of one of the pages here, it's very clear about what's supposed to happen in this case. It has uh, it has instructions to what they call the receptionist, who I think they mean actually the bank teller. It has another little letter kind of written within that letter that is for the bank manager and what they're supposed to do. Um, right off the bat, it, it talks about uh, no alarm, don't trigger an alarm, don't let anyone leave the building. Uh, and obviously, I don't know if the teller is just are trained not to respond to um, demands in this way, but obviously they didn't because they literally had people just walking out, just filing right by this guy. Uh, another interesting thing about the letter here, and I'll have a link to this in the description box below, of course, so you guys can take a look at it for yourself, is there's two plans kind of built in here, which it, it's kind of weird to me that, I mean, if you're going to rob a bank, aren't you going to ask for a certain amount of money and you know that's it? Not if you're this group of people. Um, they have plan A or plan B. Plan A is if you can only give us $150,000, we want them in 50s and 20s only. Uh, 50s preferred. So weird to me that that's stated in there like this. Uh, that would prevent only the bomb. That would only essentially save the bomb hostage. But it says we will retaliate. Uh, unfortunately, this copy of the letter doesn't go into what the retaliation is. It's referred to a couple times in this letter, though. Uh, I don't know if it's assumed that there would be later bombings or something to happen at that building or something along those lines. Uh, but then there's plan B. For $250,000, we will defuse the bomb to save the hostage, and we also won't retaliate. Everyone will be safe, and that's that. Really strange the way this is written. It's really strange to me that there is so much written. Um, I mean, just to read through this letter and to process it all would take minutes, <laughs> not to mention the interactions that they're talking about having here, you know, get this part to the bank manager, have him read this part. It's, it's kind of strange to me that all the planning that seems to have gone on around this didn't include some simple mechanics uh, like, you know, maybe checking out bank operations a little bit. I mean, this is the internet age. I think you probably could have done an internet search to find out uh, how much money would be freely available or how the vault system works, that it's probably on a timer of some kind. Uh, I mean, even regular little like store vaults have timer systems. You can't just go and open them up. You have to go and enter the code and then wait for a period of time 
usually something like 20 minutes, go back, enter the code again, and then it, it opens. So to think that a bank wouldn't have some mechanism to keep you know, a quarter of a million dollars locked down is kind of silly. And we know it's silly because ultimately Brian wound up leaving with less than $9,000. Um, so very, very strange. Now, what did the witness think about uh, Brian's demeanor? He was sort of scared. He looked calm, but he didn't look one way or another. He didn't act cocky. Uh, this lady who had a cell phone called 911 and said there's a robbery in progress at the PNC Bank on Peach Street. Uh, three minutes later, he strolled out of the bank. He had some kind of bag or something in his right hand. He walked to his car and drove off. Uh, so that is the end of the eyewitnesses account. Now we're going to move into some other information here about the police. Uh, Brian's behavior, his odd calm always troubled the police who never ruled him out as a conspirator in his own death. Uh, I, I don't know if that's worded properly. I really can't believe that this guy knew he was going to die on this day. Uh, I don't think that he was necessarily a conspirator in his own death. Uh, if anything, if he was a conspirator in the robbery aspect that's one thing. Uh, I guess if you go down the thought that he knew it was a real bomb, that that was part of the plan the whole time, but he got stopped by police and then he couldn't go to get the keys to disarm it, perhaps then you could say that he had something to do with his death because he knowingly put a live bomb on, on himself, uh, tried to do something illegal, got stopped for that something illegal, and then had to sit there until the, the thing went off. Um, but that is a real stretch for me. I just, I really, really struggle with that. Uh, something else I struggle with is just the way that they armed him. You strap a bomb around a guy's neck and then you give him a shotgun. Does that lead me to believe that he might've been involved or not? Um, I don't know. It's a really strange aspect. Give a guy a shotgun. I mean, wouldn't you have a fleeting consideration if, if you were completely innocent, you were a pizza man that shows up to this situation, someone straps a bomb around your neck for a second when they put a gun in your hand, aren't you thinking, can't I use this to get out of this bomb somehow? Can't I, the guy that just activated this thing, what if he's going with me? Now I've got, uh, I'm assuming it's a one shot shotgun, but you know, if I'm going to die today, this sucker that just armed this bomb is likely to go with me. Couldn't that have gone in a really, really bad way? handing a shotgun to this guy. Um, I don't know. I really, really wonder about that aspect as well. Uh, and another interesting thing about his odd calm, something that uh, did come up in the Netflix series is the fact that Brian actually grabbed a lollipop while he was in there. Uh, and I think he was literally sucking on it as he walked out of the building. And um, some people debate, was that something that he was doing like as he was waiting to make it look like he was interacting normally uh, in the bank. You know, he's waiting for them to read this ridiculously long letter. Uh, he's just standing at the counter, wondering if people are looking at him, grabs a lollipop just as a matter of something to do to make it look like he's not there robbing a bank. Uh, I don't know. According to what we've heard from the eyewitness here, he's specifically saying this guy didn't act cocky. Uh, now, if he was then grabbing the lollipop and, you know, kind of acting like a jerk on his way out would be a whole different thing. But I just, I don't know that that's what we have in this situation. It doesn't seem like it with uh, the eyewitness testimony that we're talking about here. Brian's instructions had been, go to the bank quietly, enter with the weapon you were given, avoid panicking the tellers or customers. I don't think he did a very good job of that because we heard from the eyewitness, we had the teller you know, screaming the trigger word right away. Uh, a gentle man with a deep aversion to violence and guns, he'd ignored orders to use the weapon if anyone does not cooperate or attempts to leave the bank. So uh, there was a reason for him to actually have the weapon in terms of the instructions. I just still think it would have been a super risky thing putting a gun in a guy's hand where he just strapped a bomb around his neck if he was not a willing participant. He'd been told to demand $250,000, but had only been given over 8,000, uh, which he put in a plastic bag. As instructed, he'd left his driving license and a sealed note for the police with the teller. Now, I don't remember if that fact actually came up in the Netflix series. It might have, and I might have missed it, but that is extremely telling to me. Uh, 
even if you assume that this wasn't the smartest guy on the planet, if you're trying to work with him in terms of getting him to do this bank heist with you, how do you convince him to leave his driver's license there? Wouldn't that trigger him to know that he has absolutely no end game in any of this? And this is a guy, we're going to learn a bit more about his history here. This is a guy that really seemed to kind of like his simple life that he had put together for himself. He didn't seem to need a whole lot of money. Um, it's just, it's really weird to me, this this driver's license aspect. And I've, I haven't seen it reported in a whole lot of other places, even looking through this stuff today. So just wanted to really point that out. Um then he continued to the first stage in the treasure hunt to McDonald's around the corner where he found his next set of instructions. The notes were hidden under a rock by the drive through sign. The second page of the notes warned Brian that he'd be watched by sentries and that if anyone follows or interferes, we may leave and allow the timer to detonate or call the cell phone detonator, which like I mentioned, we already know wasn't really legit. Um, those who knew Brian find it inconceivable that he'd have been part of any crime. He lived alone with three cats. He liked to help people. Uh, he even took the hubcaps off his car because they were too shiny. I know Brian wasn't a participant. That's not the way he was, says his brother, John Wells. Uh, even if he was going to be doing something like this, he wouldn't put a live bomb on himself. He wouldn't lock it with four different locking devices and no way of getting it off. Uh, it really does not seem like someone in their right mind would do this kind of thing. And that's one of the questions that's coming up on this Reddit thread that it seems like might have been uh, inspired by the new Netflix series that only started eight days ago. But in this conversation, people are really wondering uh, about his mentality. Was he possibly struggling with some type of developmental disorder? Uh, it sounds like we already heard that he dropped out of high school. Can we learn some more information about all of that? Yes, thankfully, there's there's a lot of articles kicking around this case right now. Um, but I wanted to point out something that Smoke and Oki said in here. Uh, he wrote down directions to the site before he left to d deliver the pizzas. And he waited for them to pay for the pizzas. There is one interview, uh, this isn't really a major spoiler, but there's one interview in the miniseries that um, pretty much confirms this, that he shows up, he gives them the pizzas, a few of them start eating the pizzas. I just, the, the, this whole scene just really boggles my mind um, that they're comfortable enough to just, hey, yeah, we're gonna eat some pizza while we're here strapping a bomb to this guy's neck. Um, but he was waiting for them to pay for the pizzas. If he was really a co-conspirator in this, he knows he's not going back to work that day. At a minimum, he's leaving with a bunch of money. Maybe he has a plan to flee the country or something along those lines. There's no way that he's going back to work. So why is he waiting for them to pay for the pizzas? And that's confirmed by someone that uh, was at the scene. I'm not going to spoil any names here, but really, really good point brought up there. Uh, so we're going back to the article that we started with, crimeola.com, which uh, thankfully there's a bunch of good information in here where we can learn a bit more about Brian and his backstory. Uh, here obviously is a picture of him. He was born on November 15th, 1956 in Warren, Pennsylvania, the son of Harold Wells and Rose Wells. His father was a utility worker. He died at the age of 60 in 1990 leaving behind his wife and five children. Wells went to Erie's East High School, but dropped out in his sophomore year when he was 16 years old to work as a mechanic. He eventually got his GED. So we have his father dying. We have him seemingly going to help the family, uh, finding a job at 16 years old and getting to work right away. But even considering all that, he eventually does complete school and get his, his GED. In his freshman year, he got two Fs, three Ds, three Cs, two Bs, and an A in swimming. Despite the underwhelming grades, Wells was actually of normal intelligence. At 16, the age at which he dropped out of high school, he had test, a tested IQ of 109, a little above the average of 100. According to an Erie District School psych Psychological Study, which was conducted because of his poor grades, he had a verbal IQ of 100, uh, but his performance IQ, which measures nonverbal tasks, was 120, higher than 91% of the population. Uh, I don't know. 
does that support that he was part of planning all this for you guys? Um, I don't know. It's it's. I, I'm kind of at a loss. It's like I read through this. I see one fact that pushes me this way. I keep going. I see another fact that kind of pushes me back this way. Uh, the study revealed that Wells got straight A's until he entered junior high school. It's thought that his father's failing health was an emotional strain on the young Wells and contributed to his failing grades. He never married. He had no children. He was considered to be a loner, well-liked, but had few friends. Uh, Wells liked playing the guitar and lottery, as well as solving crossword puzzles. He also enjoyed watching the TV show Survivor and the musical Jesus Christ Superstar. So once again here, this sounds like a nice, simple life, um, but then we get this aspect of the lottery kind of kicking in here. Is this someone that was really lusting after larger amounts of money? Um, also, this article is depicting a fairly kind of clean and simple version of this man. Uh, this is a guy that it appears might have been into some type of drug use, was certainly into um, prostitution, uh, hiring prostitutes in particular. Uh, so, but those things aside, um, it's just it's another point, another one of these sticking points that that points out for me. Uh, what's going on with a fascination with the lottery? Uh, when you have this type of lifestyle, what is it that you want? What what else is there? You're there with your three cats. You live in a nice place. Uh, I guess if you want a bigger home so you can have more cats, uh, I don't know. I, I just I'm not sure what the lottery fascination is. Or maybe. He just has a little bit of a gambling thing or just likes a little game of chance every now and then. It could be something really simple, but it does point to potential for him being enticed by a larger amount of money. Over the almost 10 years that Wells worked at Mamma Mia's, he only ever called in late for work once when his cat died. Very dependable, obviously, from that statement. Uh, for the most part, Wells had almost no interaction with police. In fact, he had a very short rap sheet committing his only crime in 1992, about 11 years before this. Uh, the police charged him with threatening to shoot a magistrate over an issue he was having with a neighbor. But it sounds much worse than it actually was. Wells told the mayor that it would be easier to use $1 bullets to fix the issue with his neighbor than sue him. Uh, Wells pleaded guilty to harassment as a summary. It is a minor as it is as minor an offense as one can be charged with. So you can see even the way that's worded. It's not like a direct threat where he's saying, I'm going to go shoot my neighbor. Uh, he made a kind of off the cuff remark that was obviously insensitive and people could have taken as a threat. It would be easier to use a dollar bullet to fix this issue than to than to sue him. On August 28, 2003, he told Tony DeTomo, the owner of Mamma Mia's, that he would like to leave by 2 p.m. or even a little earlier. He was planning on spending the evening with his sister at their 73-year-old mother's apartment, eating pizza and watching TV. So we know how dependable this guy is. And now this fact, once again, kind of pushes me back in the other direction. If he's so dependable and he really didn't want to be a burden to Tony, uh, would it be completely out of the realm that he knew he wasn't going to be back after this phone uh, this phone call around 1.30 and he wanted to make sure that Tony was going to have someone else to cover deliveries after 2? Maybe. But then we also hear about this plan that he has in the evening to spend with his family. Is that plan really... Uh, in play? Do you think that he was really anticipating on going uh, to his mother's apartment to visit with his sister? I don't know. It's really, really strange. Based on a lot of the information that we're seeing here, um, it's not that he, it's not, I don't believe that he's simple, so to speak. I believe that this is a guy that enjoyed putting together a life that was simple for himself so he could en just, just enjoy it in the way that he wanted to. Um, was he struggling with being in that? You know, there's interviews with his landlord and stuff. We're not really finding information that really points us in that direction. Uh, of course, his family is being uh, defensive. Of course, they're taking the point of view that he had nothing to do with this. Um, 
I think any family in this situation would do that. So we can understand that there might be a little bit of a bias in their comments, but we're also, you know, we're hearing from a guy that watched how he was operating in the bank. Uh, like I mentioned, his landlord, very clear about just what a nice kind of simple guy this was. Um, it doesn't seem like we're getting any information that he was any under any severe pressure where he needed a bunch of money for some reason, nothing like that. So I don't know. Is he involved or not? Uh, Wells completed the first task, entering the PNC bank on Peach Street and giving the teller the note demanding uh, a quarter of a million dollars. The second note read, exit the bank with the money and go to the McDonald's, get out of the car, go to the small sign reading drive through in the flower bed. By the sign, there's a rock with a note taped to the bottom. It has your next instructions. Uh, he drove there straight after he left the bank. Uh, he retrieved that note, but he was arrested uh, before he got to the next clue, which was directing him to a wooded area several miles away. Uh, Wells claimed that three unnamed black men placed a bomb around his neck, gave him the cane, which was really a disguised shotgun, and told him to rob the bank and complete several other tasks. If he failed, the bomb would go off. Um, another interesting thing here, if you consider the fact that they did some switcheroo on him and all of a sudden this was a live bomb. Uh, wouldn't he be mad enough at any point when he's sitting on the ground on the ground with his hands cuffed behind him and he knows that this is now a real bomb and it's likely to go off at some point? If he was really a co-conspirator and he knew the people that he was dealing with, if, if you were in that situation, wouldn't you start rattling off names? I, I would. Absolutely. <laughs> if they were going to take me out, I would do everything I could to make sure that they were not going to be free people after that. So why is he still sticking to this? Is it strictly because of the threat of uh, them saying that if he says anything else, they're going to use the cell phone detonation? Potentially, but we're talking about a serious amount of time passing. He's literally hearing ticking in his neck piece, and he knows that if a certain amount of time passes, this thing is going to go off. And he knows that police aren't letting him go anywhere. He's begging with them, uh, you know, aren't you guys going to help me try to get this thing off? He's seeing that that's not happening. So at some point, when you're faced with your mortality like that, don't you just say, I know the people, it is X, Y, and Z, and you have to get them. And I don't, I, I really, really struggle with the fact that if he did know these people, that he didn't turn on them um, and that he stuck to this story. But he does stick to the story. So, once again, what does that do for your needle in terms of his involvement? Which way does it push it? Uh, the police did not attempt to disarm the bomb, as they are not qualified, obviously. Uh, and because Brian was somewhat calm, or rather he wasn't acting the way they thought a man with a bomb collar on would, they didn't think it was real. They did call the bomb squad at 3.04. Uh, he sat on the pavement with his hands cuffed behind his back, waiting for the bomb squad to arrive. The police took position behind their cars with their guns drawn. Uh, at one point, he asks a trooper, did you call my boss? Once again, if he is anticipating getting this large sum of money that, and to the point where he had to leave his driver's license to get this money, so obviously he cannot go home. Why is he so involved with these elements of what should be considered his past life at this point? Why does he care about his boss knowing anything about what's going on here if he was really planning on pulling off this grand scheme, getting all this money, and then having to hightail it out of town because he left his driver's license in the, the, in the bank? It just, the logic of it really doesn't work for me on that side of it. Uh, Brian Wells re re repeatedly pleaded with the police, telling them the bomb was live. Uh, he said, why is, why is it nobody's trying to come get this thing off of me? I don't have a lot of time. Um, he pulled a key out and started a timer. That is Brian saying that about someone else. I heard the thing ticking when he did it. It's going to go off. I'm not lying. And then, of course, at 318, Brian Wells starts to fidget, scoots backward. The bomb starts to beep, and then it detonates. Uh, it's really a terrible scene. Uh, it was broadcast on live television when it happened. Wells was blasted onto his back. The bomb ripped a five-inch gash in his chest, died on the pavement. The bomb squad arrived three minutes later. Really, really terrible outcome there. Uh, immediately after he died, police began looking for evidence. In his car, they found the gun 
that was made to look like a cane. Uh, they also found the instructions and where he was supposed to go to get his next clue. So they followed that. They picked up the scavenger hunt. They located the container with the orange tape in it. They found a note telling him to go two miles out of town where the next clue would be in a jar in a wooded area. It's kind of interesting to me that all of a sudden now they're getting him out of town. Does it sound to you guys like maybe they're trying to get him clear of other people so that this thing can go off and not harm anyone else? Kind of what I thought when I read that. Police did find the jar he was supposed to find, but it was empty. Once again, was that the end game? Was that the spot where he was supposed to uh, actually end, have his life ended by this bomb? Whoever put the bomb collar on Brian Wells was most likely watching him and police and called off the ordeal. I don't know if that assumption is correct. There's something very strange to me about the phrasing of getting him out of town, a couple miles out of town, telling him to look for something like a jar, having the jar actually be there, which means at some point someone had to go there and place that. Why wouldn't they have put whatever the next instructions were in the jar at the time that they were doing that? It seems to me like that's where the end game was supposed to be. Uh, could it be that they would have assumed that he would go find the jar, find out that there was nothing in the jar, uh, they would be able to monitor him while he was doing this, the bomb would go off, and then they could go to his vehicle to get the money and then leave with the cash? I don't think he was going to be carrying the cash around outside of his vehicle once he was going to these scavenger hunt stops. So. Was that the potential end game for how, are they, how they were going to get the cash or were they going to stop him on his route to one of these places, take the cash from him? Um, it doesn't seem like it. I, don't, I really don't know. Wells was found wearing two shirts. The outer one spray painted with the word guess didn't belong to him. It was a taunt. Guess who's behind this? And I think it still is a taunt. Um, and it's interesting that... Uh, the cockiness, just even in that, does not seem to match his character. Uh, what else is interesting about that is how did they know uh, what shirt would fit him in terms of having also this bomb collar on? Uh, did they just, you know, get an extra large? I mean, what if the pizza guy showed up and he wore a 3XL or something like that? Were they just not going to use the shirt at that point? So there are elements of that where you could look at it and say, no, they had they had to know him at least. And um, I think it's clear that they knew him. The question I really have is, was did he know them that well? Was he really involved in the planning of this? And then they pulled a switcheroo and put a live bomb on him. Um, I don't know. Where I'm at after looking through all this stuff is I was hoping to find information that would kind of push me to one side or the other. And ultimately, I found information on both sides that stacks out just about evenly <laughs> and leaves me, unfortunately, just as lost as where I was with the start of this episode. But that is why it's a brain scratch. If I had an answer, it would be on case cracked, right? Um, it's just a terrible thing to happen in either aspect, even if he was a conspirator and then they switched it to a live bomb. What a horrible situation as well. Should someone have their life ended because they wanted to rob a bank? Um, I don't know. I don't know, guys. What do you think? Let's talk about it in the comments below. Thank you so much for spending time with me during this. I really appreciate it. I appreciate each and every one of you out there. Are any of you now motivated to watch Evil Genius a little bit more? Were you already familiar with this case? Let me know about it. I hope each and every one of you out there has a wonderful weekend. Please come back next week to the Lord and Arts channel. Uh, quick reminder, Monday is actually Memorial Day. It's a holiday here in the U.S. No video on Monday, but videos will continue on Tuesday. Trying to put something a little special together for Tuesday. Not quite sure if it's going to come together yet, but one way or another, I'll have some video for you guys on Tuesday. Take care, everyone. See you back here next week.